Welcome to For the Record, an unfiltered view on current trends and timeless advice for surviving in the aesthetics industry. Whether you're an injector, practice owner, sales rep, or marketer, it's time to set the record straight. Each week, we cut through the chaos and showcase diverse perspectives and winning ideas from the best minds in the industry. I'm your host, Dr. Tiffany Hall, Chief Growth Officer at Aesthetic Record. Now, let's get started on this week's episode. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of For the Record. This is the last one before the last one of season one, and we've saved an incredible guest to get you on to episode 19. We have today with us Kim Burke, who's a nurse practitioner in Chicago and owner of Kiss Aesthetics with two locations now, serving lots of patients in the Chicago area. She is a Chicago lip boss, if you've seen her Instagram, which means we're going to talk a lot about lips today. She's also an entrepreneur who is hiring and developing and succeeding with multiple practices, but she's also training nonstop both in her practice and on stage. She was at Aesthetic Next recently doing a big class on PLA, and she's really growing her wings and spreading her wings and taking the industry by storm. And we have her here today with us to tell us all about the things that she's doing to make her practices and herself both a huge success. So Kim, welcome to our podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I just really want to um, express my gratitude for everybody that has, you know, given me opportunities in the industry and just really believes in me. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, you had an audience of about 800 recently who believed in you on yeah. the Aesthetic Next. No biggie. <laughs> Yeah, that was really, really fun. That was, you know, Sculptra. Well, sorry, I don't know if we can say it, you but can. PLLA, that's, I can. Okay. Um, Sculptra is one of my favorite things to do. I mean, I know my Instagram handle shows something different, but, you know, you got to be catchy. People don't always know what Sculptra is, but, you know, that is that's my jam. I really, really enjoy doing it. It's, it's, it's not something that everyone knows how to do or do it well. And yeah, I mean, I am grateful to Aesthetic Next that you guys asked me to, to speak on it. And, you know, I have been getting a lot of people reach out about questions that they've had and just kind of walking them through the process. And if they've had, you know, trouble and just kind of holding their hand and making them more comfortable with it. So it's been great. It's been great. Well, we're going to dive into that a little bit later, but I do think to your point, sculpture is such a injector specific product you know everyone has their own form, yeah their own dilution their own do we use a cannula do we have clogging do we use a hot dog roller or a vortex i think it's such a specific thing that when you find someone who's good at it and who understands it and has successful results you know all the time people cling to you like they're probably thinking about you right mm-hmm. now like oh my gosh get kim burke in my practice right now and teach me how to use sculpture because i think it is yeah. it's like the jewel you know it's like the little crown jewel mm-hmm. product so Mm-hmm. Hopefully we're going to hear lots about your training as we go through this podcast. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But let's let's start from the beginning. We were laughing before the podcast started, guys, that, you know, Kim's done like all the atrics, pediatrics, geriatrics. She's kind of <laughs> done it, all, the, all the things in her 16 years as a nurse practitioner. So take us to the very beginning, Kim. How did you decide that you wanted to even pursue a career in medicine? So that's that was one thing that I feel like I've always known. I it, that's no, nothing I ever wavered on. Um, I've always been interested in the medical field, um, helping people. But what's been interesting is that, you know, my parents have always told me, you know, you're so creative. You're you're creative. You're you're an artist. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I am the worst artist. I don't know how to draw. My handwriting is okay. I don't paint. Like, what do they mean? But they could see something in me that I don't know that I found right away. And you know. Initially, I was definitely drawn to the medical field. I was doing neonatal ICU, uh, loved that. Then I did women's health, loved that. Um, Went into emergency medicine, did not love that. That was not my jam. I was not, at that point, I was also in grad school. So I think, and my kids were two and four. So I started a new job in the ER, was in grad school. Kids were two and four, and I was like, Oh, now there's a trauma. Yeah. Give me the sore throat. Give me the ear pain. I'm all over those. I do not want anything to do with these traumas. So I kind of learned that, you know, this, that that kind of glamour and glitz and glamour of being that, you know, doing all the codes and that, that's not necessarily my, my, um, my favorite thing to do. I mean, when I was young and hungry in the neonatal ICU, I always wanted the sickest baby and wanted, you know, to do the ECMO patients and all of that. But as I grew, I was like, I have enough stress in my life. I don't really need that. So, um, 
once I was done with grad school, done with the emergency room, then um, went and worked at family practice at uh, an FQHC clinic, which is uh, essentially like a health department. Uh, did that for about three years. And that was, I, you know, I always say I have no regrets. I have no regrets. I learned a ton. And I also learned that I needed to move on. <laughs> so I uh, took a position with United Healthcare and I did um, their Medicare home visits, which was a really, really nice cush job. Although I wasn't using my brain at all. I mean, it was, I envisioned myself retiring from this company. Um, I basically could set my own schedule, made great money, great benefits, but I was bored. I was so bored and I just missed, you know, being creative and having a challenge. So, and my kids, you know, were a little bit older. So I was like, you know, I, this is aesthetics is something I've always been interested in. And I think I'm going to start just kind of dabbling. You know, I'm just going to take a little class here, a little class there, and we'll see where this goes. Really, honestly, with no intention of making it my career. I mean, I think a lot of people in this industry, we all kind of have the same story. You know, um, it's like we we somehow got involved in it. And the next thing you know, bam, here we are. You know, we have we have a business. We have other injectors that work for us. We have a team and it's in it's, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. So it, what started off as just kind of a little, you know, I'm going to dabble turned into something, which I'm grateful for. I mean, it's, it's, it's truly my outlet, you know, it's, it's the, like I said, the perfect mixture of medicine, creativity, artistry, um, you know, helping build confidence, but still having fun and, you know, just making people feel the best that, they feel, you know, it's, it's, it really, it really has been an, an awesome journey that I've been here. But you know what I wonder, Kim, and this is to your point, everyone that comes on the show has the same story, right? They start out in medicine, they've done something, they've yes. been happy. Like at what point do university programs say, we should have a specialty in aesthetics. We're losing all these nurses, physicians, PAs to aesthetics as a, as a, you know, a practice, a specialty. Why don't we train them from the beginning so that they can be really good at this on day one? Like, I, I often wonder, like, when is that going to happen for us? Do we have to keep waiting people to, like, fall out of, you know, geriatrics, neonatal, all these things to come to our world? Or do we ever get to actually start in aesthetics? I, I think that that is an amazing question. I also, I find that a lot of clients, you know, my own clients or people that are, you know, taking my trainings are new grads or new nurses, and they're they've always known that they wanted to do aesthetics. They're hungry for it and they don't know anything about it because their school has taught them nothing. You know, I mean, they really truly are green and I was, was the same way. I didn't learn anything about aesthetics in undergrad or grad school. It's, it's a very special industry and that that's a great question. I would love to kind of push forward with finding out why. And I think some of it has to do with, you know, funding. And um, I actually had a conversation with Brittany Crosdale about this um, not that long ago and talking about getting like the, um, I'm, there's ANCC and then there's um, AANP getting accreditation because basically all we have right now is CANS, right? And minimally you need a million dollars to get that sort of just to get, you know, heard and start the process of making it a certification. So that's, it's, there's a lot of barriers. There's real, there's really a lot of barriers and it's, it's a, it's a really good question that unfortunately I don't have an answer to. Hopefully we will though at some point. Well, it's interesting. You don't know this, but I'll tell you, I'll tell all our listeners. So in doing our CE credits, our CMEs for Aesthetic Next, um, Kim was one of the first ones who we went through and, you know, started looking at her bio and all of her credentials and things. And they came back and said, she's a marketing person. And I'm like, she's what? Yeah, she's what she's doing is marketing. We can't we can't accredit marketing, and so you kind of started the conversation with this company, CE Source, which, by the way, disclaimer: don't use them if you're in aesthetics. And they and they ruled that all of our uh, non physicians who were doing aesthetics were in a position of marketing. They were in a marketing company, and I said, you know, I said, let's look at you. You were the example. So let's let, let's look at Kim. You know, look at her background. She's obviously been a practicing nurse and across you know multiple specialties. She's seeing patients in a healthcare you know environment. These are prescription procedures that she writes a prescription for, and then she you know, performs them, and they were not having it. So the week before our conference, we had to find a new CME provider because they ruled that anybody who's a non-physician in aesthetics 
that any procedure that was done here was just a marketing procedure and that you were all you all owned marketing companies. And so I think there's a gross misunderstanding across the non aesthetics industry about what we actually do here. That these are real patients, you know, vascular occlusions. We had a whole thing on adverse event management at the conference because it's a real thing. People go blind for the rest of their life. You know, these are not this is not like getting your hair cut and getting your hair colored. And so I look at all of you doing all this great work with training and, you know, I think, gosh, you're having to make up for the fact that in the you know, the educational years of a nurse or PA or physician, they're not getting any of this training. They get none of it unless they find you and they come out and pray that you're going to help them. It just frustrates yeah. them beyond all, you know, all, sorry, we're off topic here, guys. Sorry, sorry to digress. But <laughs> well, it's interesting that they think I'm marketing because that is like the first, I would love to be marketing. This is an industry where you really need to be good at marketing, but yeah, no, not so much. That's, that's, that's really crazy how, if anybody that's a non-physician, right? That's what you're saying, non-physician, was considered marketing. Yeah, they said we, we could hmm. make the case for physicians that they were doing surgery and it was aesthetics, but anybody who was not a physician, that they were just, they owned a marketing company. I, I was like just floored. Like how, how could you even think that? But for those of you who are listening, if you have a good CME provider, we use PeerPoint now, but if you have any alternatives, let me know because we have one that you should never use in aesthetics, CE Source. Don't do it to yourself. But anyway, I digress. But Kim, you're the one that sparked all that because I like lost my mind over you. I was digging around your background to show them all the things that you've done that you're a real nurse. You're like a real nurse with a real degree. Jeez. Well, thank you. Thanks for going to bat for me. Jeez. Well, we did. We did. Wow. Well, Good. So I appreciate that. Thinking about that, you made the leap into aesthetics and here you are. So did you start out in aesthetics working for someone else or were you moonlighting and doing your own thing? No, I was, um, I don't know. When I look back at that I'm like what was I thinking what was I doing I because I was just like yeah I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do this I'm gonna make this work and I refuse to fail so having that kind of mentality of I refuse to fail it's kind of a blessing and a curse because you know in the meantime I'm also married and have children but I'm starting a business that I refuse to fail at so I'm dumping all of my everything into this right because I am not going to walk away a failure and this is this is going to work there's no other way so I did that um for about a year a year and a half and it was and it was going really well um professionally I just got to the point where I, w I had to take a step back because the other things, meaning my family, my husband, my kids, my house, my life was falling to the wayside. My friendships, I was so invested that I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to work for a plastic surgeon. I'm going to work nine to five, clock in, clock out, do what I do injecting. And then I can have my work-life balance. Right. So I decided that I can always go back to being an entrepreneur and starting, you know, not starting the business again, but going back to my business and picking up kind of where I left off. So I did that. I worked for a plastic surgery group and, um, you know, it was, like I said before, I don't, I have no regrets. Everything I feel like I've learned down the road, it's been for a reason and it's shaped and molded me into what, who I am today. And that was kind of a wake up call for me. I, I was like, you know, I don't know that this is the right fit for me either. So it kind of made me stop in my tracks and say, okay, listen, you are a business owner and you can do that well, but you can also try to be a good wife and a good mother as well. So you just need to work on the balance. So I, you know, made a commitment to my, because I mean, I would come home from work and my husband, I would just da, 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 and listen to this. And not that I know how to run a business, but you know, obviously our business models were very different. And I just, I just had such a hard time getting on board because it was very clear that I was a number and nothing else to them. I was not a provider. I was, I had, my ideas didn't count. It was just, you will, you know, you show up, you do your job, you go home. Like if I would, I'd be calling meetings with them. I'd be like, Oh my God, I have a great idea. Listen, what if we do this? And they were just like, it was, I was annoying to them. And I, and then that was just, you know, I slowly was learning. I was like, yeah, no, this is not the right fit. I need to do my own thing. I really, really do. So I, you know, decided to take a step back and you know I left that position and um, that's when I opened my Tinley Park location and you know things have just kind of been progressively moving forward since that it, it 
there's everything was a stepping stone in my eyes, I guess. Well, I think as you work for someone else, you learn all the things that you do or don't want to do. I think that's hundred percent. I've come from mm-hmm. corporate America to startups, back to corporate America, back to startups, like on and off my whole career. And I feel like it's very much the same as like you take some things that you did really great that you thought were done really well, probably more the professionalism of having a bigger organization with a surgeon. You have, you know, billing and all these different things. But then you think about all the things you want to do differently when it's your own. I totally get it. So how long ago was yep. that that you started the first one? Uh, four years ago. So four years is when I started in Tinley Park. And then prior to that, I was on my own and then with the plastic surgery group. And then finally said, okay, I'm, I'm back and I'm, I'm doing this, but I'm going to, I'm going to attempt to balance, which is still difficult every single day, <laughs> as you know, but you know, we get through it. It's, I have a good, I, my husband is going to heaven and I have a good team on my side. Um, my kids are now 14 and 16 and, you know, we were just setting up for a training the other, was on Saturday here at the, at the office. And, you know, we have to remove furniture and, you know, move this around. And so my 16 year old son was here and uh, he's just stopped and he goes, I'm really proud of you, mom. And that just like, I just melted. I was like, they see me hustling. They see me working. They see me. It all makes sense, you know? So it's, it's the little things like that, that. You know, it's it, it may look glamorous from the outside, right? You're a boss babe and, you know, you're, you're girl boss. But what they don't see is all these sacrifices, right? It's like, you know, well, I can't really go out to dinner tonight because we need to do this or I need to get this. And um, I have to work on a presentation or I have to update my PowerPoint for my training or, you know, we need to. It was after aesthetic next, my mind was blown. My head is still spinning. My head is still spinning of all the things, right? Whether it's business, clinical, we sat down for like three hours as a team. My whole team went and we were like, all right. Cause I had two girls on business track myself and my other injector, Ashley, we we're on the clinical track and we were like, holy hell. All right, let's sit down. We need to revamp things. We need to, you know, redo some protocols. We need to change up some things on the business end. And, it, and it's, it's like, it's, I always keep saying, oh, as soon as I get past this, I'll, things will calm down. And it's just, it, this is just life. And you know what? I'm grateful. It's, a, it's not a bad problem to have, but it's, this industry is changing so quickly. And unless you're keeping up with it, it's, you don't want to be left in the dust, you know? So you just have to continue to grow and evolve and, and learn. Well, I think what you just said about, you know, it's changing so fast. We were actually building decks for Static Next. And in the course of that, we had new protocols come out for adverse events. I was changing the deck for Ronna Canelli and for Julie Bass Kaplan two days before the conference because an article had just come out that changed a protocol on Hylinex and how much you should be giving per, you know, per the initial treatment. So to your point, it's changing so rapidly. But I think what you just said that I think people should hear is when you went to a conference, you came back as a group and you went through all the things that you should or shouldn't be doing. Like you looked at across the scope of what we've learned, what's important to us, what's not important to us. I think people so often come and check the box like, yep, got my CMEs. I went to the conference. I did my Instagram posting. Now I'm back home and life goes on. Like that, to me, you missed the whole thing. Like the whole point of it is to, is to look and see where you can grow or what you think you're doing really well that no one else is doing yet. Or, you know, I did that five years ago. They're just now catching up. I think that's the important part of it. So, you know, looking at your own business, like what is your current business model? Because you, obviously you have two locations. You guys didn't catch that. She has two locations in her Chicago area in four years, which is, by the way, crazy town that you have two locations in four years, bless your heart. But thinking about that, what's the setup of your business today, like your current business model? So basically, you know, I was the sole provider, sole injector, you know, handling essentially everything. Um, My now uh, basically CFO, I would call her, she happens to be my best friend. She has an accounting background. So she was like, um, I think somebody needs to do your books. And I was like, I'm super organized. I have all my receipts. They're all right here. And she was like, um, that's not what I mean. (laughs) So, um, she kind of helped me on board with the back end. Uh, and then once it was too much for her, we onboarded my current practice manager. Um, I was still doing all the injecting and then it just kind of got to the point where we're using a scheduling platform where there was a wait list and I was on vacation and my practice manager calls me. She's like, Kim, you have 34 people. And it was, was July. So it should be a slow month. You have 34 people on this wait list. Like you're losing people. You're losing people. So I was like, okay, yeah, no, I need to, I need to onboard somebody because I can't, 
I can't do this alone. I don't want to do this alone. So um, I actually onboarded Ashley, who's amazing. And she was actually one of my clients. She, I could tell she had, she's a little spitfire. She's a little hustler. And I could see that in her. And she's hungry and motivated. And um, she had no injection experience. She was working in like a med surge trauma unit. That girl would work 312s, come off a night shift, shadow me all day long go back in, work a night shift. I mean, she, you know, she basically showed me that she wanted it and that she was, she was hungry and ready. So, you know, she shadowed me for a good six months. Um, and it was, there was no, um, guarantee on either end. Um, you know, I'm teaching her everything and, you know, this was all on her time. I'll volunteer. Um, and there was no guarantee that I was going to A, hire her or B, that she would even want me, you know, want to work for me. Maybe she, she may go down the street and work for the next, you know, med spa and, you know, maybe got a better offer. So, um, it, that was, that was really key to me. I, you know, played around with, should I hire somebody that is, that has experience, that has, you know, book of clients, not that, you know, I, we necessarily needed it at that point, but, to me, it was really, really important to keep things consistent. Consistency, I was like, I want to know that my clients, if they're seeing me, if they're seeing Ashley, or if they're seeing any of the other injectors, that this is the result. It's all going to be the same. So that's how I onboarded my two other nurse practitioner injectors is that from my trainings. So that's, that's the beauty of having these trainings. It's like, not that I'm you know, having these trainings because I'm potentially looking for a new hire, but it's, you can see, it's almost like an unofficial interview. You can see, you know, their, how they deal with, with clients and, you know, if they're humble or if they're overly confident or if they're not confident enough, like you can kind of see, and you can kind of pluck them, you know, which ones you think would be a good fit. So that's how I found my other two uh, nurse practitioners that now uh, work with me as well. So it's, I, there's definitely a culture that I think somebody needs to kind of fit into at Kiss Aesthetics here. It's, I mean, we're, we, number one, we, we have a lot of fun. Number two, we, there's no bullshit. Like we're very honest and forthcoming and almost to the, probably to a fault on my end where I'll be like, you know, I don't really think you need that. I'll, I'll talk people out of procedures. And like, some people are like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, listen, I'm not going to sell something that I don't believe in, you know? So, um, it, we all have to be on that same wavelength. We all have to kind of have that open trusting environment. And, you know, my, the clients that we have, the, the goal is to have them for lifelong clients. I'm not looking for them to, you know, be shopping around and find the best deal. Like, you know, we don't, I don't personally run promotions anymore. My clients are my clients. And if you want to come and see me, you see me from me and my skill, not from my price. And if you don't like it, then that's okay. You know, we're maybe not the best fit for you, but it's just kind of an honest, open. And like I said, fun. Like we have so much fun every day. We, we truly do. I mean, ab workout every day. <laughs> well, so how do you, uh, speaking of the 34 on the wait list, I think that's a big thing that people struggle with is do I have enough patients who I can't see to justify having a second injector. People often say, well, it's not enough. You know, 34 is not enough for another person. But I'm thinking to what you, you know, what you said, what your practice manager said is like, but we're going to lose all 34 for sure. Like we know we're going to lose them all if we can't see them for the next six months. But if we bring the second person on, we have to now stretch and start marketing differently and, you know, onboarding people. And you and I both know onboarding is a pain. It's a necessary evil. You've got to do it. But to your point, it takes a long time. It's, a, you know, very high touch. So like now thinking about your, you know, your spa, if you have a certain amount of patients who are waiting, how do you decide to bring on, you know, the next person? Like, what is your litmus test for that? Well, that's a great question. And I feel like the, um, I never really had cold, hard numbers, but coming back from Aesthetic Next, Carrie and Amy, who are my administrators, were in the business track. And I, it was probably your talk. I don't know. Um, when they said, that when your injectors that are are at about like seventy percent capacity was that was that yours? No, but I believe that number is very very much so. so. Yeah, so seventy percent capacity when you know when Ashley and Ashley is at that point. Um, I you know I'm at that point. We're beyond that point. So it's like we need to start kind of grow learning, onboarding new people, um, getting them from get-go uh, green, 
And I know, yeah, that, that's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, but that's what I that's what I prefer. I mean, of course, if I have an amazing injector who I know is going to, you know, respect the way that we do things here, awesome. But if somebody's green and hungry and wants and wants to learn, then I'm down. We're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to trial this and see, and see if this is a good fit. You know, we got a date before we marry, you know, we got to make sure it's a good fit because, there's, this is like my baby. I can't, I can't be, <laughs> I can't let anybody be, anybody be on that circle unless you know that they're the right people. Well, and divorce is tough, both at work and at home, right? I think divorce in the workplace is oh. sometimes even harder, but you said 70%. And I have a question for you that maybe may not make any sense to anybody listening, but as I kind of unpack it here, I think about our team at Aesthetic Record, you know, they're doing demos all day. They're doing training calls all day. And it's like, I don't want them to be doing that hundred percent of the time. Because if they're 100% of the time focused on only that, mm -hmm. they can't, A, grow their own skills, right? Learn and develop themselves. They can't contribute to the business in a different way. Like, I want them to give me ideas and help me think about strategy and what's next for us and, you know, idea over new products we could be selling or new things we could be offering clients. If their entire life is from, you know, sun up to sundown, just doing a demo call or just doing a training call, when do they have time to think about anything but that? I just feel like it's such a disservice right. to the employee to say, you're going to be a drone from eight to five or eight to seven, whatever the hours are. You're going to just do the same thing all day long with no variation of any sort. I just feel like that's a miserable place to be. And I don't know if you have, you know, would, what, what your thoughts are on that, but I feel like we miss in our world. We kind of miss that part of it. Of like they could be giving you so much more than just injecting. If you just let them have the freedom to communicate and you know be part of the meetings and that kind of thing. A hundred percent. And that's, that's huge to me um, because I am not the end all be all. And I think it's funny because my team kind of, I'm very forthcoming with the fact that like, Hey, if you think you got a better way to do things by all means, let me hear it because I, what I am thinking is probably not the best way. So it's, it's conversations. It's, you know, there's no hierarchy. There's it's sitting down and having real conversations. Um, one thing that I have learned is that I spend a lot of money on education, not only for myself, but for my team. Um, you know, we all went to Aesthetic Next. We all flew to California um, in June. You know, I mean, it's, we all need to be on the same wavelength. And it's one thing, yes, you know, I can go to a training and come back and then try to spit out everything I learned. And it's just not going to transfer the same way. And, you know, especially with Aesthetic Next, there was, there's, I mean, there still wasn't enough time in all the days for, you know, us to even digest all the content that was you know thrown at us so it was spending time and investing in your team and your educate and educating them and you know having them further themselves and wanting that I mean that to me is extremely important and like I said you know we have weekly meetings and these meetings aren't me sitting there at the front with the da 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 like and they try to humor me and they'll be like, Kim, well, what do you think about this? And I'll be like, mm, I'm not really sure. What do you think? And they're like, see, I told you, I told you. <laughs> like, it's just funny because I mean, we, it's conversation. It's a conversation. It's not at all. Um, you know, I mean, we're all in this together in the day to day in the thick of it. And it's, it's really important that we're all on the same page. When I just think about too, even like your trainings coming back and training people, does your staff help with that too? Are they part of your training events each time? Yeah, um, I probably need to incorporate them more because it's becoming a little bit too much for me. I mean, I'm I'm slowly learning that I'm it's it's constantly too much, right? I need to be better with delegating in general. Um, I'm just not very good at it. Um, so I do have staff that's involved. Ashley will, you know, pop in on some days and kind of work with some hands on and, you know, chime in. And sometimes, you know, I'll have her sit up in front and I'll be drawing on her face when we're talking about vasculature and things like that. Um, but I, I, I really do <clears throat> need to incorporate them more. And, you know, in 2022, that's kind of, you know, the training and the KISS Academy per se is we're going to be building that up even more and kind of growing that and and which I'm excited about but on the flip side I need to spend more time out of the clinic in order to do that so that's a balance too so I, I'm, I'll be learning to find that <laughs> we, need a, we all need a class on delegating if you can find a great oh. class on that you send, send it my way because I'm terrible at it yeah. I'm a control freak and I can't help yeah. it 
you know, it's, it, yeah. just, it is what it is. And so I feel like probably to your point, you know, you with patients is if somebody has a bad outcome, no matter who did it, the buck stops with you, right? If they work for you and they have a bad outcome, it's still on you. Like there's no chance that you get 100%. to escape that. It's so like here, if, it, if yep. there's a bad experience, it's, it's still my fault. Whether I've touched the thing mm-hmm. or not, it's still my mm-hmm. fault. And that's a hard place yep. to be to, to lose control, not lose, but to relinquish control and then, mm-hmm. you know, have to kind of at the end, pull it back and take control of something that you didn't really create. I know it's hard. Trust mm-hmm. me, sister. It is. It is, but you know, I, you can't do it alone. I've unfortunately learned that the hard way, you know, you, you just can't. And I think that that's why figuring out who fits that culture and who you can trust in order to, you know, be your right hand or your eyes and your ears when you can't be there. That's, that's key. That is key. Well, now that you're four years into this foray, what are some things that you've learned along the way or that, you know, to your point, you look back and say, goodness gracious, that was a stupid move. I have a lot of those, by the way, in my, in my Rolodex, but what are things that you've learned or things that you would tell somebody who's new to this starting out, trying to own a, you know, own, a own their own practice that they should be watching out for? You know, I have those moments every day <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, that might not have been the best way to handle that. Um, and it's, there's so many that it's, it's hard to just kind of pinpoint one, but um, I guess I just try to take every every experience encounter good or bad and just kind of mentally note it and say how could how could we have improved that or what could have changed to either make that better or you know what exactly happened it's just kind of learning from learning from your mistakes and unfortunately that it sounds like a very cheap and generic answer but it I I I truly have, you know, I, I have thought something is going to be amazing and great. And this is going to be the end all be all. And then I'm like, Oh mm, yeah. Okay. Not so much. So moving on, we're going to do the next thing. And I think, you know, just having others in the, in your corner, you know, your inner circle and people believing in you and you put your trust in them, they put their trust in you. And it's just, it, it a hundred percent, you know, having a team on your side, you just, you can't do it alone. You can't, you just, you really can't. So, okay. Thinking about lessons that you've learned, I ask this question a lot. You've listened to the podcast. You probably know that. What's one thing that you didn't expect? You know, we, we talked to Sarah Allen early on. She's like, all the contracts, the legal, all the consents and questionnaires and all. It's like, I had no idea it was going to be so involved. What, what's something that you thought, gosh, this is going to be so easy going into it. And now you're like, wow, that took mm-hmm. a lot of work and a lot of effort. So, you know, working in this industry it's awesome and beautiful and so many good people and good mentors, but there's always going to be the haters. There's always going to be the ones that, um, you know, that try to ruin your reputation, try to poach your patients, try to, um, you know, degrade you, um, decredential you. um, And, that that to me, and I really try to start like all my trainings with this, but the very first thing out of my mouth is that like, look around you. These are your friends. These are your colleagues. These are your people exchange numbers, exchange Instagram handles. Like this is your network. These are your friends. These are not your enemies. These are your friends and your colleagues and they will help you and they will hold your hand. And if somebody's not there to do that for you, then you don't, you don't need them in your life. It's kind of just like, I've, I've unfortunately had to, um, you know, witness that firsthand where, um, you know, it's a cutthroat industry. Let's be real. It is, um, as much as we can say it's all fluffy and beautiful and peaches and cream, it's, it's, it can get ugly. And, um, I have learned very early on to not engage in those behaviors Um, even when clients come and they sit into my chair and they're like, oh my God, I just was at so-and-so's and and it was terrible. First of all, I don't care. I don't care. All I know is you're here. You're in my chair now. So let's make this right. Let's do this. What are you looking for? What can we accomplish today? What's going to make you feel more beautiful? I don't ask where they were. I don't engage in, and you know, sometimes they really want to, they want to engage. They want to bash. They want, and I'm, you know, I just, I take the high road. I don't, I don't, I choose not to. I surround myself with good people and good energy. And if I'm not getting that from somebody, whether it's a 
colleague or a client, then that's okay. They're not my people. They're not my people. And there's plenty of others that I have, you know, can have good energy with. So um, that's probably one of the biggest takeaways, the biggest things that, you know, like, yes, paperwork and like what you were saying, Sarah Allen, you know, consents, legal, blah, blah, blah. Oh my God, I had no idea. But that to me has been like, wow, not everyone has your best interest at heart, you know, and it, it's kind of a wake up call, it kind of hurts, but you know, once again, you grow, you learn, you grow and you say exactly that is not what I'm going to be. Well, I always, you know, as a kid, I would always say if people don't come for you. They don't hate you. You're not working hard enough. You know, I feel like there's this idea where if you don't do anything all day and you just kind of hang out and you exist, no one cares about you, right? You're not important. But when they start like coming for your people, for your business, they start imitating you and, and stealing your ideas. It's like, huh, you've arrived. You know, you've made it. You're you're worth poaching now. You're worth, you know, people coming after you, which is a very sad place to be. But I feel like our industry, to your point, that is the thing that I think is unique to aesthetics. You don't see this. You know, I think dental is a little bit the same way, though, because there's so many dentists out there. But ours is different. But, you know, I look at you. You're, you're a top 100 injector, which – Someone argues a popularity contest. Like you've got to be kind of famous to get on that list. You've got to be well known. You know, you have a pretty big Instagram handle. Like you're doing a lot with social media, and so it's almost like there's two different schools of thought here in our industry. One is like you can build a big clinic without Instagram, right? You can build a big clinic, have a good following of Instagram, but you can build a big, you know, revenue producing clinic without thinking about all the other stuff, without having to be like the best and the biggest and the, you know the Christian Subios of the world. But then if you want to be all of that, you have to be an influencer, right? Be all the influencer thing. So how do you manage the time that you're spending growing your brand as like Kiss Aesthetic versus growing Kim Burke as an injector? Because that's two very different brands, although tied together, but very different. That's tricky. I mean, social media is a blessing and a curse. It's, you know, I don't market. I don't, I never have, I don't spend one dime on marketing. All my clients are, you know, and I would say my Instagram following, it's all organic. That's one of the big things that I kind of, um, pride myself on. I mean, my people that follow me, they're all pretty local. They're all my clients. They've been following me. They're friends of friends. They're that either, you know, are have appointments to see me or have seen me. Um, but Instagram or social media in general, TikTok, whatever, it's, it's, it's exhausting. And sometimes I just need to, I need to turn it off, you know, I mean, cause you can get so caught up in all of the noise and the glitz and the glamour and this one's doing this and oh my god look at that and it's it's a lot it's it's really really a lot but on the flip side it's grown my business it's done amazing things for me so I think balance is a key and once again I'm still trying to learn that but there are times where I am, you know, I'm in a mode and I'm like really active on social media and I'm always posting my story and I'm commenting, I'm liking, da, 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 da. and then I'll go dark for days because I just can't, I, I just, I can't, I need, I need a minute. I need a minute to just kind of get back down to my roots and, and breathe. And, you know, I mean, it's, it is, it's a lot, but it's, it's something that is a necessary evil. I don't want to call it evil, but it's, it's, it's true. It, Instagram has been huge. I just can't handle TikTok too. I, I, I can't do it all. I don't know how these people do it all. I can't, I can only handle my one platform. People are like, oh, I sent you a message on Facebook. I'm like, oh shoot. Okay, cool. I'll look at that in a minute. <laughs> Well, so yeah it's a lot well you know they send me dms on my personal facebook all the time about ar like how could you do this whatever i'm like you know what i check my personal facebook like rarely if ever you know i post on instagram and it carries over to facebook on a personal note like right I'm like if you need me that's the worst place to find me like send a, a note to you know to our company don't send a note to me personally when you have a complaint because it may not get looked at for like six weeks i'm so sorry right and i can imagine for you guys you know they're dming you like i think about adverse events all the time how many patients would DM Ugh. you and say, I've got a bruise that I think is, you know, there's a problem here. And I'm like, don't DM me on Instagram or Facebook me. Freaking mm -hmm. call the practice. Like, I think we've mm -hmm. almost made it where we're too accessible now that people yes. can't choose the right place to say the right thing. It's like they get very confused. But mm -hmm. anywho, mm -hmm. think about Chicago. So you're in Chicago, which is like a highly competitive market. Holy cow. There's like, you know, a menagerie of all of you in Chicago who are all phenomenal injectors. How do you get your, like, how do you stand out? Do you, do you care about that, first of all? 
or are you like focusing on your little niche or your little target audience or the you know the Chicago lands and focusing on just growing that population so yeah I mean do I care about it not really um there's we have a hot market we have awesome injectors in the area um who are also my friends I mean we have a tight knit group that is um you know I mean I have I definitely have my local people that I can legit call when I'm wanting advice or if I'm upset about something or if I'm, you know, concerned about a patient that I know that they're coming from a good place and that they mean well and they, you know, they're going to give me their honest, their honest opinion. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in the suburbs. I'm not in the city. And that's where I, that's where I like to be. I like my Manuka clinic here. It's actually kind of funny because I, li- I live in this town and I never in a million years thought I would be having a clinic here, by the way. It's like a little tiny town right off the highway with like maybe 12, 13,000 people. And they, people will come and they'll call when they get off the highway and they're like, we're in the wrong place. This isn't right. And we're like, nope, we're right across from the grain elevators. We legit have grain elevators across the street from us. I mean, we are rural. The Tinley Park location is closer to the city, so we get more of the city traffic. But, you know, it's interesting because it's I, – I never – ever would have thought that yeah we're gonna we're gonna build a practice here and it was just kind of on a whim someone was like you know you should really should consider opening a place here in Manuka and I was like why I'm good like I'm plenty busy in Tinley and I'm, I'm good and then I was like you know I do actually have a lot of clients out this way just because I live out this way and I was like well even if I don't grow that's fine I have kind of like a closer home office like literally my kids would drive their bikes up here in the summer and like stop in and get water and you know I'd have to kick the kids out like all right guys come on no 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 this is this is my office I'm seeing clients you can't just like barge in and be all sweaty but there's something to be said about that because it's literally it's a we're this is a little town and you know we all know each other and it 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 feels kind of homey you know, it, it feels, it feels good. So, you know, being competitive with the other injectors in the Chicago area, I don't, I don't necessarily feel that I'm sure, you know, there definitely is that somewhere down the road, but like, I'm kind of in my own little bubble and I, and I kind of like it. I'm good with it. You know, I, I, I have my friends, I have others in the industry that I'm, you know, friendly with and we get along and, you know, you go girl, you do you. Like, I mean, I have plenty of other business owners that are, you know, in this area and I'm like, high five. Yes. You're killing it. You know, I mean, give credit where credit's due. I mean, there's no need to be, there's plenty of wrinkles, right? There's plenty of wrinkles that for everyone, we don't need to fight over it. And the people will come, the people will come to you, to me, to, you know, if you're good people and they feel that they'll, they'll come, they'll, they'll feel that energy. Yeah, I agree with you. I think people get really overwhelmed. But again, that's like the social media thing, right? Do I want to be famous or do I want to make sure that my practice is growing and successful? And those are different goals. I mean, I, I look at people who have a huge Instagram following and actually a very small practice because they're focusing the majority of their efforts on this like Instagram presence, this persona, this influencer model. But then their practice is like a little hole in the wall where they may or may not see a lot of patients because they're working on like their brand. So I think you have to make, yeah. you've got to make choices early on about I had a discussion with Keith Marcus many years ago. He's a surgeon out in uh, Redondo Beach. He was like, Tiffany, I don't want to do Instagram. My practice is thriving. Like, I don't need it. And I'm like, but Keith, for your personal brand, you have to have it. It's like, it's fun to watch him even evolve, thinking, yep, is it growing my practice or growing my personal brand? And they're very different you know, mm-hmm. goals. But thinking about you from, from a brand perspective and training, so you've made the decision, I think, to focus really on the private trainings. I'm sure that mm-hmm. you can take a job right now with Allergan or Galderma or Revance or whoever else you wanted to take a job with to be a trainer you know, in the morning. What's your impetus for choosing to go the private route versus looking at more the manufacturer route? And do you want to end up in the manufacturer route long term? So the like I said before, what I enjoy about the private route is that like I can make it my own. I can tailor. I mean, I'm editing like how you were editing those slides two days before. I'm editing my my slides like five minutes before my, you know, my my students show up just because it's, it's mine, it's my own, and it has my name attached to it. And there's really nothing, I can't hide behind, oh, well, you know, so-and-so gave me that slide deck and blah, blah, blah. It was a bad training. No, this is my training. And I, it, it's my, I take the initiative to really, really focus on 
the things that I feel are important. Obviously, you know, I, and I tell them, I'm like, listen, I can, you're not paying, you know, the amount of money for a, for this course, for me to sit here and discuss all the facial anatomy. Like you need to know it. It's important. You need to learn it. Like as much as it may be boring and not glamorous, you need to know it. Okay. So take that home, make it your homework. This is why you need to know it, you know, because we're going to go over, you know, vascular occlusions. We're going to go over drop brows. We're going to go over all those not so glamorous things. And it's, it's something that, you know, I can tailor, I can speak off label. I can, I can give little recommendations here and there. Um, you know, being, being a trainer for, you know, any of the big companies that that's, it's, it's something that I'm, I'm in the process of, I'm open to it. It's, um, you know, it, it, it's not something I feel like I necessarily need because I, I, I do plenty of my own private trainings, but it's, you know, it's, it's a stepping stone. You know, I think that once you're on those platforms, you have a little bit more exposure, um, to be thought of as, you know, somebody who really has a lot of integrity in the industry and, you know, it's, it's in the works. It's all, in, it's all in the works. It's, I'm, I'm not in like a huge, huge rush to be doing any of that, but you know, I think it's, I think it's a compliment when you can say I'm a trainer for, you know, Allergan or Revance or Galderma or whatever. I think that that, you know, it's like a feather in your cap, you know, it's just kind of like you can add it to the resume because the company believes in you kind of a thing. So I think there's definitely pros and cons to both. But having said that, you have to stay on label and you can only teach this, but you know, that's the beauty of the privates that you can, you can do both. I think you made a great point about your slide deck. You know, it's interesting to me over having worked for Galdermo for many years, you know, I would build the slide decks for the trainers and hand them over. It's like, let me prep you on the slide deck. You just say what I told you to say kind of thing. You know, now on this end of it, as I look at people who turn in, you know, decks for the conference, you can tell those who have only ever trained for manufacturer. They have no idea how to start their PowerPoint deck. Like, what do you, what do I say? Yeah. And they turn in. I mentioned this, I think, last week, week before, they turn in, like, the deck from Galderma or the deck from right. Merge. Right? But, guys, you can't turn in someone else's work and say it's your own. Mm -hmm. It's called plagiarism. Like, mm -hmm. let's think about that. But they have no frame of reference to say, I've never been on my own to do this, been responsible for the content. I have no idea how to even think about an outline of the class or a curriculum for a class. Or I think coming yeah. into it from what you're doing is, like, you can go on a podium in the morning, speak about whatever you want to speak about, and you understand how the content should flow, right? How it should look, the images. Mm -hmm. You get this great video at the front of yours, which by the way, end up being so funny because you couldn't say sculpture on, on stage. But, you know, you're doing it as a curriculum writer, not as a person who's just delivering someone else's content. So, you know, if you want to become a trainer, people who are listening to this, I think doing it on your own in the beginning is a great way to learn and grow as a presenter and an educator. And then take that to your point as a compliment to say, now that I'm really good at doing this, now I feel confident about going to work for Galderma or Merge or whoever else and delivering their content. I think there is a, it's a journey, if you want to call it that, to, to get good at it. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. It's, you know, and I think that anybody, I don't want to say anybody can be an injector. Anybody can be an injector. Anybody can, you know, speak on podium. Anybody can do this. But it, there's other things that, like you, how you said about the slide deck, like, yeah, you can give me a slide deck and I can maybe speak about it, maybe not, depending on what the product is. But I probably could fake my way through it. Would it be a good presentation? Mm, probably not. But, you know, to to have some personality behind it, some charisma and like, you know, maybe, you know, kind of make fun of yourself, but have it be funny and engaging. Like that's, you know, there, that's the difference between somebody who can go up there and, and you know, re reiterate some slides that we can all read on our own versus actually, you know, talking about it in real time situations and, you know, personally I've had this experience and this is how I handle that versus, you know, just reading the, the slides, you know, one by one by one, you know, it just, it's, it's just more engaging and more fun. Okay. So I want to discuss your Instagram name though, because you mentioned in the beginning that you love Sculptra. You just said that you're training mm -hmm. all the time in your clinic, you're doing all the things. How did you decide to be the lip boss, the lip guru? Oh, where did that end up? I feel like initially when I first started in this, um, lips were very intimidating to me because they were, they were glamorous and people always want to see your before and afters. And if you're going to display that, you better be good. So, um, I just really try to kind of dive into that and learn about it. You know, uh, trained with Julie Horn, 
uh, learned with, from others and you know, other amazing injectors in the industry. And um, as a Christmas gift one year, um, one of the estheticians that I worked with gave me a t-shirt that said, you know, lip boss and it was cute. And I was like, Oh my God, that's so cute. You know? And then it's just kind of hung on. Like, I mean, clients would see it and they'd be like, Oh, they're lip boss. And did it. And people would call and be like, well, I want to have an appointment with the lip boss. And it just, it just stuck. And it's something that is kind of a marketing genius guru, really, you know, it's catchy. Um, you know, obviously I do a lot more than lips and some people don't know that, you know, they're like, so do you just do lips? I'm like, oh man, I got to really do a better job of marketing my other skills. I'm like, no, I do everything. And they're like, oh, well, I wouldn't know that. <clears throat> so sometimes it's, a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's like kind of a, a blessing and a curse because people like lips, that's what they think of. But no, I can do a lot more than lips, but that's kind of how it, it started and kind of caught on and, um, yeah, we've just been kind of rolling with it, you know. It's 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 just kind of a fun name. Yeah, it sticks because I call you the Chicago Lip Boss all the time. I'm like, you know, the Chicago Lip Boss, because it's like, you know, the only one. I think people. I think we know people by their injector or by their Instagram handle more than their actual real name, like all the time. A hundred percent. Yep, a hundred percent. I'll meet. I met people at a sudden. Like, so I'm like, oh, you're so and so. Your injection spot, blah blah blah. And they're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, yeah. Now I know who you are. It's so funny. It's super funny. I know, but that's kind of where you know where we all are, but. Thinking about that from a marketing perspective, uh, you actually had a call today with a mutual friend of ours, Cameron Hemphill from Growth99. So you know, he yeah. does marketing. He does all the things, frankly. He's the guy's a genius. But, you know, thinking about your own practice and growing it, you know, both your brand, your practice brand, beyond just the lip injector, you know, the lip boss, how do you leverage consultants and people to help you with your business to grow it and to do the things that you can't do? Because you mentioned delegating before. Like, that's a great way to do it, right, to hire consultants to help you. But Give us an idea of the lay of the land as we're thinking about growing and expanding our own brands. You know, people like Cameron, how do they help you with your business? Well, I think we all have lanes. Um, and, you know, I think staying, sticking to what we're good at, right? And finding what that is and something that I'm, I'm not a business person. I'm not. And I'll be the first person to say that. I am a clinical person. I'm a medical person. But business, I am like, I've never taken a business class in my life, which I probably should, but I just, when is there time, right? So it's it's finding those people that are good at, at you know, at Cameron, for example. You know, he's good at website development, marketing. He, you know, specializes in aesthetics. Bam, you're hired. Here you go. Here's my website. Have at it, you know. I'm not good at that. I don't want, I don't want to know about it. I don't really, I mean, it's very important, but like my SEO and the algorithms and the Google, the, 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 great. I'm glad you know about it. I don't really, I care, but I really don't. So I'm going to stick to what I do. You stick to what you do. Um, you know, same with the financials. You know, I, you talk numbers to me. I, I don't really know my numbers. That may sound terrible, but I have people in my corner that I trust that I'm like, all right, so listen, we're I'm thinking about buying this device. What do you think? Is this something that, you know, we can afford? Can we, is this a good financial decision? Like, what are your thoughts? You know, so just kind of finding the, the you know, consultants in general, I think it, they're super helpful. Um, you know, I, I would love to incorporate more of that because I'm so clinical and I, I need to have, I need to have be more global and, you know, I'm learning along the way, but also I think that everyone has their place, right? Like we, you know, sometimes I'll get my nose into something up at the front desk and, and I'll confuse everybody. They'll be like, okay, stop. No, go back to your room. Go, go back to your injecting. <laughs> I'm like, okay, sorry. I thought I was helping. They're like, yeah, no, mm -mm, not helping, making it more confusing. I'm like, okay, you know what? I just got to stick to what I do and trust that I have other people on my team that do what they do and they do it well and, you know, hope it works, basically. You know, we just got to put our faith into them. Delegate. Learning. What we see it all the time here is like we've been on the phone with the, you know, the front desk girl for I don't know, 10 trainings, 10 hours, and she's well-versed. And then the injector calls, like, no one's even calling our practice. We're out here by ourselves with no help. I'm like, hmm, we spent 10 hours on the phone with Sally in the front desk. Maybe we should ask Sally. But to your point, though, it's like whatever lane you're in, you got to kind of stick there, or all of a sudden things get very yeah. confusing and convoluted, and, you know, it's a hot mess. Mm -hmm. So thinking about that yeah. from your perspective, like at what point do you think, if ever, which the answer could be never, 
where you transition from being an injector less, like you'll inject very, mm -hmm. you know, seldom and be more of like CEO growing the business, you know, is it franchising? Is it more school, you know, training kind of things? Like, is that in the future for you or do you want to stay really tied to being the clinician? That's a really good question. I ask myself that on the daily it's, and my husband's like, so what's your vision? What's your goal? Cause yesterday it was this and today it seems like it's this. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I know. And it's a, it's a, it's a really good question. I'm kind of at that, that turning point now where I'm like, okay, I think, I think going to aesthetic next kind of, um, put things in perspective for us as a, as a practice to grow injectors and grow clinically. But I, I need to be spending more time doing admin things. I need to be spending more time focusing on my trainings because that's, I love doing that. I, I, um, you know, really enjoy the feedback I get from it. I enjoy talking with the, you know, potential injectors along the way as they find their job and being their reference and things like that. Um, I like going to conferences. I like speaking. I like doing all of that. And all of those things are not here, you know, having me be here present in the clinic. So um, I think having his aesthetics function and function well, if when I'm not here, because um, I do, I'm learning the hard way that I do need to take more time for admin things, less time injecting, more time for admin things. Cause right now I'm like four days a week injecting and Monday is my admin time and it's not enough. <laughs> I mean, I love injecting. Don't get me wrong. It's like my, it's, it's my favorite, but if, if I'm going to continue to kind of grow and, you know, launch and do bigger things with the company, I, I need to kind of, put my energy in those things as well and trust in my staff and injectors that, you know, they're kind of keeping the Kiss Aesthetics brand consistent along the way. Yeah. You're, you're at that point of learning that only doing things that you can do is important and no one else can build the business, but you, no one else can do the training classes, but you no one else can speak for you on podium, but you, it, it's a, it's a tough place to be at. I talk a lot about the pie maker or the, you know, the pie owner, yes. which one do you want to be? Mm -hmm. And I think it's hard, mm -hmm. you know, at some point it's almost like you have to grieve that person that you were, that was just injecting all the time and having this like mm -hmm. injector, I shouldn't say like a love affair, but you know, it was fun and exciting. It's what you did all day. It's like, Oh crap. Now I've got to actually run the business. It's a much different role. And mm -hmm. you find yourself, you know, even me, I find myself longing to do those things again because I enjoyed them at some point. But if I do that mm -hmm. now, I can't do all the things that I have to do or we don't move forward. And so it's a, right. it's a tough spot to be in. It's like, a, it's professional maturity, which is a, is all, always a hard lesson to learn as you grow, but you're doing it, mm -hmm. but you're doing it, which is great. Yeah. And you know, it's one of those things where sometimes I'm like, why am I, why, why, why am I doing this? Why am I not sleeping? Why am I, you know, so obsessed with this? But then it's like, you know, things like COVID happen, right? Where it's like, wow, nothing is promised. There's not one thing that is promised to anybody. So it's like, you see all these businesses that, you know, once COVID happened, they're, they're no longer, they folded, they, whether it's aesthetics or any restaurants, and it doesn't matter. It's, it was a big wake up call on my end where I'm like, wow, you know, just because things are good today doesn't mean tomorrow things are going to be good. Like, I'm just going to keep on trying my best today and, and, you know, hope and pray that things will continue to progress, but nothing, there's no guarantees. There are no guarantees. So you kind of have to strike while the iron's hot, keep that momentum going and, you know, not fall to the wayside. So that's kind of my takeaway from COVID. I mean, it, it, it was a big wake up call for me to see these big companies no longer in business anymore. You know, they just, they couldn't survive. So I don't know. There's there's a lot, there's a lot of learning along the way, you know. Well, I'm hoping that 2022 we kind of right size back to where having a full year where we're not in COVID limbo, if we can get this stuff out under control in the next few months, will give us a perspective on how we're going to go forward as, a, as an industry. Because I think right now, to your point, like our friends in Canada, you know, they're still going in, in and out of lockdown. We have friends in Australia who mm -hmm. have been in for like 285 mm -hmm. days. They've not been able to leave their houses. Can you imagine? You have to put a bullet mm -hmm. in my brain. I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. busy body. No, I know. So, you know, I think everyone's different, but um, mm -hmm. I look forward to seeing you in a sec next four next year. Yay. Sure. And hopefully at Absolutely. many places along the way doing all that you're doing, but give us some um, information about how to find you for training classes. If we want to get training done with you in Chicago, how do we find you and get signed up for that? 
So um, you can DM me. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, that's probably the best way. Um, you can call our number here to register for the trainings. And I hear, Tiffany, that you guys in AR are going to be um, doing you're onboarding a, some sort of a platform for trainings. Is that right? Are, yeah, we'll have some fun things coming very, very soon. So I look forward to that because we need that for sure. So um, they can call. So you can call the um, number for the office here. It's 708-717-3509. Um, you can DM me at uh, Chicago Lip Gloss Kim Burke. Um, Cameron's going to be fixing our website. So it's a little bit more user friendly just because, you know, I mean, we built that sucker years ago and it just needs an overhaul. So Cameron, please, please help a sister out. <laughs> so that will be even better. And we're going to have a whole training link. And like I said, 2022 is going to be our year for that. So in the meantime, you can call, you can DM me, you can find me on social media. Um, and yeah, we just look forward to what, you know, this exciting aesthetic adventure is i mean it's a journey it's an absolute journey and it's good times good times well guys i'll tell you from watching kim at the conference talking about sculpture just knowing her personally and the things that she's doing it would be money well spent to go train with her so if you're thinking about oh thank where you to go what to do next i'd recommend that you check her out we'll put it in the comments or in the little bio too for the podcast so that you guys will know where to go to find her but for the record i've had a great time talking with you today i cannot believe it's been an hour it just seems like it's been a blink of an eye but I look forward to our next cocktail hour, either at Am Spa or Yay. at Next, wherever else we find each other. But That's we're right. doing some big things. You may think that you're not a business person, but I would venture to say that you very much are a business person because you're growing a big brand all by yourself, really, with great talent and doing it the right way. So I think that you that you you can check that one off your list, sister. You are an entrepreneur for sure. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate you having me and inviting me to the podcast and Aesthetic Next and it's it's just been it's just been a great fun ride i'm i'm just very grateful for all the opportunities that that i've been given well we're just getting started so look for kim as she's popping up all over the country and maybe with some manufacturers soon as well as a trainer but for sure on any sort of platform that we have we'll always have you included in our stuff no doubt about it so awesome perfect well, we'll see you guys all back next week for our season finale and again kim thank you so much for your time today and we look forward to seeing what's next for you in 2022 Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening to another episode of For the Record. This podcast is not intended to provide legal or medical advice. It's for entertainment, education, and information purposes only. For more information on this week's guest or to get started with Aesthetic Record, email us at info at aestheticrecord.com. Be sure to tune in next week for more fresh perspectives on disrupting the status quo and surviving in the aesthetics industry.